I'm Douglas Smith. My story is called Symphony. Fast forward, third movement, dance macabre, staccato. They had named the planet Aurora for the beauty that danced above them in its ever dark skies. At least it had seemed beautiful at the time. And now Gar Frank wasn't so sure. Gar huddled on the floor, shielding his two-year-old son, Anton, from the panicked colonists stampeding past them in the newly constructed pod link. Damn you, Frank. When will you make it stop? A man cried from across the corridor. A woman lay in the man's arms, convulsing as her seizure peaked. She was dying, but to Gar's numb mind, her moans harmonized with the screams of the mob into a musical score for his private nightmare. Anton sat on the floor, a broken comm unit held before his blank face. The child let it drop to strike the metal surface with a dissonant clang. More people fled by. The child ignored them. With morbid fascination, Gar watched Anton repeat the scene. Pick up the comm unit. Let it drop. Pick it up. Drop it. Again. Each clang as it struck the floor was more chilling to Gar than any cry from the dying. This attack had blown the colony power grid. The only light now came through the crystal roof. Gar looked up. The aurora blazed and writhed in the night sky, the parody of the chaos below. Well, Symphony is a science fiction first contact story. Uh, in, in it, uh, a colony ship has fled uh, a plague on Earth, carrying the last of the human race. Uh, the ship's biosphere is failing, so time is running out for them. The story is told from the viewpoint of Gar Frank, the communication officer. His wife, Clara, is the ship's laser and photonics specialist, uh, and that plays a role in the story. Their two-year-old son, Anton, has recently been diagnosed, uh, diagnosed as autistic, causing Gar to retreat into his work, and uh, his marriage has also become strained. At the, as the story begins, the colonists have found an unpopulated Earth-like planet with a beautiful aurora. But when they begin a settlement, they're attacked by the aurora itself. Uh, Gar must learn to communicate with the entity. But the, um, the story turns on his problem. How can he talk with an alien when he can't even talk to his autistic son or to his wife? Um, I'll mention that Symphony was also a finalist for Canada's Aurora Award for Best Short Fiction when it came out. Uh, in terms of developing the plot for the story, um, <clears throat> because it's a first contact story, um, when humanity, if, if or when we meet an alien race, the first barrier uh, to overcome will be uh, communication. So in terms of how that communication uh, might happen, uh, in the story, I decided to combine music with um, synesthesia. Uh, music can communicate across human cultures who don't speak the same language. We know that. Synesthesia is a, a neurological condition where something that's meant to stimulate one of your senses ends up stimulating several senses. So images might produce sounds or vice versa. Uh, I combine these two ideas uh, to tell a story of humans creating a visual symphony to talk to an alien entity that is composed entirely of, of light radiation. And once I had that concept, um, I broke the story into four scenes, uh, which I labeled as four movements of a symphony to mirror, mirror what I was doing in the story. These movements also mirror the plot structure as I start in the action um, of an attack on the colony, as you heard from that excerpt. And then I have a flashback to give the backstory, and then I move back to the present. So the story's uh, four scenes are movements two, then one, then three, then four. Yeah, um, well, I write mostly at novel length now, even though I started with short fiction. So I guess the, the big change is I've become familiar with developing plots in much um, larger works, moving from short fiction then to my first novel. And now I'm working on a, uh, <clears throat> a trilogy with multiple point of view characters. I'd say that I'm, I'm now confident that I'm going to find my way to the end of any story. Um, 
I, I don't do detailed outlines. Uh, I'm not an outliner, but I'm also not a, a pantser either. Um, I call my plotting approach Headlights on the Highway. And it comes from a quote by E.L. Doctorow. Uh, he compared writing a novel to driving across a desert at night. Uh, you can only see the road uh, ahead as far as your headlights illuminate, but you're still able to drive across an entire desert that way. So when I start a novel, um, I know my characters. That's critical to me, and I know what their problems are. So those are my, my drivers for the trip across the desert. Uh, I know the end of the story, what my driving destination is. And I know the, the key events um, I want to hit in the story, sort of the towns I'm going to pass through and the turns I want to make on the trip. But I don't do an outline. Um, I'll write three to five chapter chunks. Um, which is like as much of as my headlights are showing me of the story at the time. And then I let those light up more of the, uh, the road ahead, the plot ahead, and then I write the next chunk of chapters. Um, yeah, I did touch on that. I'd, I'd say uh, my main recommendation is you have to understand that characters drive plot, not the other way around. So you've got to start with an interesting character or a group of characters who are uh, struggling with a problem. Um, and all the plot twists and turns in the book or the story have to come from choices that your characters make as they struggle to solve that problem. Um, if, if your characters are acting simply to advance your outline plot, you know, they're doing things you need them to do to fit your plot, it's going to come across faults to the reader. You can't just move characters around like chess pieces on a board. Um, you still need to have a plot in mind. You have to know where you're going. But the plot turns, the, the plot has to advance by um, your characters making believable decisions. Uh, the other tip I'd give is that you should start your story as close to the character's problem and to the key action, the key uh, first event in the story as you can. So in Symphony, um, as you could tell from the excerpt, I begin during an attack on the colony. Um, the plague that drove them from Earth, the ship's failing biosphere, Anton's autism, um, the, the friction between Gar and his wife, uh, Gar's failure to communicate with the, the alien entity and his son. All of that comes out as the story progresses after that first scene. So don't start with the backstory. You let it trickle out through the, through the telling of the story and let the action progress. Oh, so many choices. This was a tough one. Um, I'm going to pick Station Eleven by Canadian writer Emily St. John Mandel. Uh, it's one of my favorite books of the past decade, probably. <clears throat> um, its plot structure is extremely non-linear, uh, and it flips between not just various point of view characters, but it also flips between the present and the past. Um, and you, you don't see how those stories are linked until the, you get later into the novel. Mandel not only makes that work, but I, I found the beauty of the book was in that structure. She weaves these characters and plot threads and the repeated objects and themes um, that slowly come together in, until they, they meet in a, just a wonderfully uh, satisfying conclusion. Uh, it's a book about a, a, a pandemic, much worse than the one we're going through right now. Um, so it's a book about a terrible um, apocalyptic loss, and yet it, it still is life-affirming and very positive, uh, at least I found it in its view of humanity. Highly recommend it for readers and writers. Okay, I, I'll, uh, I'll give a shout-out to my uh, amazing granddaughter, Bridget Fry, who uh, is part of the uh, multi-award-winning Toronto indie duo, uh, Moscow Apartment, and uh, they recently had their second uh, EP released, and it's doing quite well. So, if you folks out there are into music, check out uh, check out Moscow Apartment.